Chemistry lecture number 43, Intramolecular Forces. We're going to start this lecture with a demonstration. I'm going to adjust the camera a little bit. Pull this forward and do that. Okay, we have a container of oil and some water with some food coloring in it. Now, when you try to mix oil and water, let's give us a good shake. Uh, they don't stay mixed. Now what's going to eventually happen is that the oil is going to separate out from the uh, water. <clears throat> now contrast that with uh, just some regular water and then what I'll do is I'll take some uh, food coloring and put it in the water and the food coloring I put it in here like that So when I add the red food coloring to the water and I <clears throat> give it a shake, the red food coloring um, disperses throughout the water and it doesn't separate from the water. There's no red layer and water layer. Uh, in contrast, with the oil and water, we do get a water layer and a separate oil layer. So why does that occur? Well, it has to do with intermolecular forces, the forces of attraction uh, between different types of uh, molecules. So, keep these things in mind as we go through our lecture. All right, please be patient while we readjust the camera. All right, hang on a bit. All right, and off we go. Atoms that are <coughs> me, covalently bonded are called molecules. And molecules are capable of being attracted to each other. Uh, the bonds between molecules are not as strong uh, between, as ionic or covalent bonds, but they can significantly affect the properties of molecular substances. Intramolecular forces are forces between molecules that hold the molecules together. Uh, intramolecular forces are also called weak forces or van der Waals forces. And there are several types of intramolecular forces. One type of intramolecular force is the dipole-dipole force. Now this occurs when the positive end of one polar molecule is attracted to the negative end of another molecule. For example, hydrogen chloride in gaseous form is a polar molecule. The partially positive hydrogen in HCl will be attracted to the partially negative chlorine atom of another molecule. So HCl is a polar molecule, this ends negative, that ends positive. So the positive end of one HCl is going to be attracted to the negative end of another one. And these red lines indicate bonding between uh, the molecules. Now there's a special type of uh, dipole-dipole force called a hydrogen bond. And this occurs when hydrogen is attached to either a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine atom. And when this occurs, the hydrogen has a partial positive charge that is larger than usual. And this higher density of positive charge allows the hydrogen to form an even stronger bond with unpaired electrons on other dipoles. For example, H2O molecules will form hydrogen bonds with each other. The positive hydrogen on H2O will be attracted to the negative oxygen. So, <clears throat> here's a picture of some molecules. Remember, hydrogen has a bent shape, so the top of the molecule where the oxygen is going to be negative and the bottom part of it where the hydrogens are is going to be positive. Well, the positive hydrogen is attracted to the negative oxygen. And since hydrogen is attached to either a hydrogen, nitrogen, or fluorine, the positive charge on the hydrogen is especially strong, and this allows for a stronger intermolecular bond to form between hydrogen and uh, the oxygen right here. Okay, so the strong attractive force between the H2O molecules is the reason why H2O is a liquid instead of a gas at room temperature. So the hydrogen bond is an especially strong bond. It really pulls them uh, close together, and that's what makes the uh, water molecules, well, H2O molecules, liquid instead of gas. And different types of uh, dipoles or polar molecules will easily mix with each other. Uh, the positive end of one molecule will be attracted to the negative end of another molecule. For example, uh, NH3 ammonia will easily mix with H2O. So, two different types of polar molecules 
water with a positive end here, and ammonia, which has sort of a uh, trigonal pyramidal shape. Uh, one end is going to be negative and then the bottom end is going to be positive where all the hydrogens are. So the positive hydrogen is going to be attracted to the negative nitrogen. And this is another example of hydrogen bonding because this hydrogen is attached to uh, an oxygen and uh, this hydrogen is attached to a nitrogen. So you have especially strong bonds here and here because the charge on the hydrogen is especially uh, strong. So different types of uh, polar molecules can mix together. Nonpolar molecules will also easily mix with each other. If two different molecules are neither attracted nor repulsed to each other, uh, there's nothing to stop them from moving close to each other. So molecules will just randomly move around each other. <clears throat> so the blue and the uh, pink dots represent uh, two different types of nonpolar molecules. And so since they're neither attracted or repulsed to each other, they'll just sort of swirl around each other in random motion. And so they can intermix. Now, however, polar and nonpolar molecules will not mix together. For example, vinegar and vegetable oil will not mix. Vinegar is mostly water, a polar substance. Vegetable oil is made of fats, which is a nonpolar substance. And when the vinegar and vegetable oil are shaken together, they quickly separate after shaking. And this occurs because the polar water molecules will be attracted to each other and clumped together. The fat molecules do not have a positive and negative end, so they will not be attracted to the water molecules. So in the demonstration I did where I mixed uh, oil with water and I tried shaking it up, uh, what happens is they separate because these all water molecules are going to be attracted to each other and they're going to clump together. All right, see the hydrogen bond right here. Oil molecules, they'll just separate out. These guys are not attracted to these guys, so they stay separate. And then the oil floats on top because oil uh, has a lower density. So consequently, the water molecules will separate from the oil molecules. So that's why... When you see something like this, that's why you have a um, oil layer on top here and a water layer on the bottom right here. These are the polar molecules down here. These are the nonpolar ones up here. <clears throat> so polar molecules will mix with polar molecules. Nonpolar molecules will mix with nonpolar molecules, but polar and nonpolar molecules will not mix. And a phrase that summarizes these ideas is like dissolves like. So, in general, polar and nonpolar molecules do not stick together, as we see from our demonstration here. Uh, however, temporary attractive forces between nonpolar and polar molecules can be induced. For example, when a polar water molecule approaches a nonpolar Cl2 molecule, the negative end of the water molecule will repulse the electrons on the Cl2 molecule. As a result, Cl2 will be positive on one side and negative on the other side. Let me show you a picture of this. So, here's a water molecule that's negative on this end right here. Here's a chlorine molecule, and these little lines here are the electrons, the negative signs. So I've got one electron here and two electrons right here. And the electrons on the water molecule will repulse these electrons on this side here. And what's going to happen is these two lines or these two electrons, they're going to move over to the other side because they want to get away from these electrons. So when that happens, instead of having the electrons here, now the electrons are on this side. See in this picture, there's one negative right here. And now on this picture, there are three negatives right here. That's because these two electrons have moved over here to give us three more additional electrons. So as a result, we have a net negative charge on this side and a net positive charge on this side. Since the negative charge has moved away, uh, these positive charges are not neutralized. So we get more electrons on one side. All right, so for a fleeting moment, Cl2 will be a polar molecule, positive on one side, negative on the other side. And then the positive end of the Cl will be attracted to the negative end of H2O, right here. So, sort of a temporary partial bond forms between the chlorine molecule and the uh, oxygen molecule. And the force of attraction is called a dipole-induced dipole force. And this force of attraction is very brief. A nonpolar molecule such as uh, Br2 can also spontaneously become a dipole. And this occurs because the electrons in a molecule are in constant motion. For brief moments, there will be more electrons on one side of the molecule, causing one side to be positive and one side to be negative. 
it will become a temporary dipole. So these negative signs right here are electrons, and these electrons are in constant motion. And then sometimes randomly for a brief moment, the electrons are going to be favoring one side. So in this picture here, you have two electrons here and two electrons here. And then as they move around for a brief moment, um, you get a whole bunch of electrons on this side right here. That makes this side negative and that side positive. So for a brief moment, there's a disparity of uh, distribution of charge. More negative on this side, more positive on the other side. Now when a Br2 molecule becomes a temporary dipole, it can induce a polarity in an adjacent uh, Br2 molecule. And the electrons on the adjacent molecule will be repelled by the negative end of the dipole, causing one end to be positive and the other end to be negative. So <clears throat> here's our temporary dipole for a split instant. The electrons favor this side of the bromine molecule, and that causes these electrons, this excess of electrons here, to repel these electrons on another adjacent bromine molecule. What will happen is that these surplus electrons will repel these electrons and cause them to move over to this side. And so what you end up happening is that this molecule here, which had a balanced charge, now has an unbalanced charge over here. So this has turned into this, the electrons have moved over to this side, and now we have more electrons on this side, giving this side a net negative charge and this side a net positive charge. All right, so we have two dipoles next to each other. All right. So we now have two dipoles next to each other and each is attracted to the other. Okay, so you have a force of attraction right here. When nonpolar molecules are attracted to each other in this way, the attractive forces are called dispersion forces or London forces. And dispersion forces are strong enough to pull bromine molecules together to make bromine a liquid at room temperature. And dispersion forces also pull iodine molecules together to make iodine a solid. So dispersion forces, they're not insignificant. They do uh, exert enough influence, at least on bromine and iodine, to change their physical state. It makes bromine molecules a liquid instead of a gas. It makes iodine a solid uh, instead of a gas. Dipole-dipole forces, hydrogen bonding, and dipole-induced forces, and dispersion forces are all weak compared to ionic forces. And the weak nature of intermolecular bonds makes molecular substances softer compared to ionic compounds. So an example of a molecular compound that's soft is candle wax. Candle wax is made out of molecules, and you can chew on wax and it won't crack your teeth. Uh, compare that with something like metal. If you try to chew on a brass pipe, it'll probably crack your teeth. So uh, molecular compounds such as wax are definitely softer. Molecular compounds also have lower melting and boiling points, while ionic compounds have very high melting and boiling points. Uh, by way of illustration, salt is an ionic compound, and you can't pour salt into a uh, pan and melt it, uh, whereas wax is a, a molecular compound, and wax you know, melts very easily. Uh, in addition, molecular compounds do not conduct electricity, while ionic compounds will conduct electricity uh, when dissolved in water and heated to a molten state. Both nonpolar and polar molecules will have lower melting and boiling points compared to ionic compounds, but there are differences between nonpolar and polar molecules. Nonpolar molecules will have lower melting and boiling points compared to polar molecules. So I guess the order is ionic compounds are going to have a high melting point and boiling point, <clears throat> and then polar molecules have weaker bonds, so um, they're going to melt and evaporate and boil more easily. Uh, so water would be an example of a polar compound. Um, and then something that's nonpolar, um, such as gasoline, uh, that's going to evaporate very easily. All right, so it requires lower and lower temperatures as you go from left to right here, because the bonds get weaker as you go from left to right. Nonpolar molecules uh, tend to be gases, which makes sense. Uh, the force of attraction is weaker, so they're going to be in the gaseous state. Uh, polar molecules. Excuse me, have stronger intermolecular forces of attraction, so they tend to exist as solids. For a PDF transcript of this lecture, go to www.richardlouis.com. This has been chemistry lecture number 43, Intermolecular Forces.